uh, I'm not, I'm a designer, not a historian. Uh, and I wanted to look um, uh, at the uh, mid-century uh, uh, plazas in New York City, uh, uh, titled Plaza City, and mostly uh, looking at privately owned public spaces today. Uh, the, the brief history, um, uh, there are sort of two parts to this. Uh, in, in 1915, the equitable, equitable building was uh, constructed and um, uh, caused uh, shadows to fall on, on adjoining properties. And the year later, the 1916 uh, zoning resolution was passed, which uh, gave us our shaped uh, skyscrapers in New York City. It, it uh, based zoning on mass. Uh, the height was, I guess, relatively unregulated, but the, the building massing was, was uh, controlled so, so as to preserve uh, light and air. Uh, I'm um, deliberately skipping over uh, Rockefeller Center, which is probably where I could start the story, but I'm focusing on uh, post-World War II uh, in this presentation. So the next part of the story really is the, uh, the 1950s uh, with uh, the Lever House and Seagram's building. Uh, and, and these buildings um, uh, set up um, uh, the next um, stage of, of, I think, urban development in New York City and they were the prototypes which led to the revisions of the zoning code in 1961. Um, so, the, so the first shift was from uh, sheer street wall to the step back buildings, and the second shift was from the street wall city to the plaza city, uh, and in particular as it was uh, put in place with the incentive zoning and the bonus plaza program. So um, Lieber House, uh, and, and, and the uh, little sketch is not mine. I, I cribbed it from uh, Google Images. But, but you can see how uh, Lever House uh, existed within the available zoning envelope. Well, Lever House was built uh, with much less density than was allowed, but it allowed them to create uh, a really remarkable building, uh, first curtain wall in New York City. But it was really the model which um, uh, set forth the post-war uh, uh, precedent in the city of creating a setback building with a, with a plaza. Uh, in this case, it's not an entirely open plaza. It has the, the low podium with the, uh, the, the donut hole that creates the uh, courtyard. And then the, the Seagram building is, is perhaps a little more pure setback building with open plaza. And, uh, and interestingly, uh, it was not intended as a social space. I, th I think Philip Johnson has commented that it was really intended as a, as a forecourt for the building. But when William White uh, did his uh, 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 seminal studies, uh, he uh, discovered that it was actually a very good social space, that people did use those uh, stone hedges and the benches uh, as, as urban furniture. And, uh, and it's a better social space than I think was, uh, was intended. Uh, and then there are the Avenue of Americas, um, the, um, the Time Life building. Uh, the, uh, the plaza here is, um, um, well, it's, it's really uh, a corporate address. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it was intended as a social space. It may well function as that, but it really was uh, defining a, a corporate address for uh, corporate buildings. Uh, by 1961, um, uh, the, the renewal program became a little more uh, adventurous. This is really part of a multi-block uh, uh, program. But Chase Manhattan, the plazas are starting to become vertically uh, integrated uh, with uh, a low rise up off of the street and also the, uh, the courtyard, which uh, integrated the, uh, the uh, lower level of the bank lobby into the, the plaza with the, uh, the Noguchi sculpture. And also uh, the... the uh, the thinking of these spaces as a public uh, sculpture collection it, with, in this case, the use of the Du Buffet to create a sight line uh, that, uh, that uh, went all the way down through uh, Liberty Plaza. And then the, the last one in this very brief history is uh, what was formerly called Liberty Plaza, uh, the U.S. Steel Building, uh, one Liberty Plaza, SOM's building. Uh, these photos are from the, uh, the renovation uh, when it was... Uh, when it was transformed from Liberty Plaza to Zuccotti Park. And um, in, in the diagram, you can see how the public sculpture actually uh, works to set up a series of sight lines and connections between these uh, urban plazas. And of course, uh, this has become an unintended protest site. <laughs> uh, 
it, it's, it's interesting, the, the bonus uh, plaza programs, because um, what was, I think, intended to create public open space for the city, much needed public open space, has often been criticized for creating fairly uh, sterile places that are uh, maybe even intentionally uh, designed to not really foster much uh, social life. But it is, it is uh, I think, interesting and, and ironic that, in, in fact, uh, these bonus plazas have uh, come to serve a, a social function in the city. So the next part, uh, I wanted to look at some of the landscapes. Uh, the first part, really, you can't talk about the landscape in New York City without talking about the buildings, because uh, the, the buildings are uh, predominantly what form the spaces that become the landscapes in the cities. It's, it's true of Central Park. Central Park is really formed by the commissioner's grid and, and, the, and the street wall around it. And most of the urban plazas of the, of the mid-century period are really formed by the, uh, uh, the collaboration with the buildings around them. So the first uh, one I want to look at is, is the Lever House, uh, 1952, uh, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, uh, restored in uh, 2002 uh, with uh, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill working on the project. Uh, and um, it was an interesting renovation project uh, it, because it raised a lot of uh, uh, questions about how do, you, uh, uh, how do you restore a modernist building. And I, I, this is not really dealing with the landscape, but one of the interesting questions on the restoration of the Lever House was how to uh, restore the curtain wall, because the, uh, there were portions of the curtain wall which uh, were uh, 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 decayed and needed to be replaced. And the, the discussion was that if, you, uh, if it had been a stone building, you would replace the, the bad stone and you would have left it even perhaps visually uh, visible so that you would understand the replacement versus the original. But the Lieber House was designed, intended to have a pristine, clean, uniform surface. And, and, and the debate at the time was if you only replace the, the parts of the curtain wall that are decayed, you would actually end up with uh, something that uh, was not consistent with the original design intent. And in fact, what was done uh, and approved by the Landmarks Preservation uh, Commission was a, a complete uh, replacement of the curtain wall. So it's, it's a brand new curtain wall. Uh, it is uh, slightly updated. It uses uh, fritted glass instead of the, uh, the, the, the shadow boxes that were originally there, but it does maintain the, the pristine, uniform surface uh, of the building, which was uh, considered to be the design intent. At that time, I was brought into the project to look at the uh, landscape, uh, which it was not very well documented and was not in very good shape at, at the time of the uh, 2000. And um, the research uh, that I did was uh, at, uh, along with Gavin Keeney, who was uh, helping me with this, was at the Avery Library where, where the SOM uh, archive was. And uh, it, it, was, it was interesting to me that you could build a high-rise building in 1952 with uh, uh, a couple dozen sheets of drawings, a very, <laughs> a very thin set of drawings. Uh, and there was, there was very little... Uh, detail of the landscape in that set. Uh, it, it, it's most likely that it was done by in-house landscape architect at SOM, the, the plantings. And while the project was under construction, uh, Izama Noguchi was um, brought into the project to do some alternate designs that were never executed. And as part of the uh, renovation, uh, we worked with the Noguchi Foundation. Uh, it was not realistic to uh, recreate the Noguchi uh, uh, design because uh, the sculptural pieces were never executed. But we, we did uh, do a uh, 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 replacement of the as-built landscape plantings, and we got permission from the Noguchi Foundation and the Landmarks Preservation Commission to uh, execute the uh, seating elements that Noguchi designed. These And because of the lack of um, of, of drawings on the landscape, we relied on Ezra Stoller's photographs uh, that were taken uh, uh, during and right after construction to guide uh, much of the, the landscape uh, preservation, restoration work. So you can see the before and after, the Ezra Stoller and the Peter Moss photos. Uh, the most significant change is that uh, we put in uh, Japanese maple instead of the uh, uh, willow tree. The willow tree died pretty quickly uh, within a number of years because it didn't really get enough sunlight. Uh, uh, and then we also 
paid a great deal of attention to the, uh, the ideas of the, uh, the landscape that goes from the exterior to the interior of the building. Uh, we clarified the plantings on the roof. Uh, uh, this is really there, there's a, uh, not a pure restoration. There was some adaptation, the replacement of the maple tree and some other slight adjustments. Uh, but I think the, the key to the success of the, the space today is that it's really actively programmed. Uh, A.B. Rosen programs it with uh, a changing sculpture program, and uh, uh, Casa Lever has a, a, a cafe in the summertime which brings people and activity to the site. Uh, also, um, it, during this period, a little bit later, is the, uh, the MoMA Sculpture Garden, uh, 1953. I think the 1964 version is the one we mostly remember that uh, Philip Johnson designed with uh, Zion and Breen landscape architect. Uh, Bob Zion was mentioned last night. And the reconstruction in 2005, uh, I, there might be some quibbles with it, but it, it uh, uh, I think largely uh, respects the intention. And uh, most significantly, it was done with the original landscape architects, uh, 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 Richardson uh, of, of uh, Zion and Breen. Uh, Paley Park, also Zion and Breen, uh, uh, I, I think one of the, the, the most beautiful uh, small spaces in the city. Uh, these are all private spaces, privately owned public spaces. And then the later uh, Green Acre Plaza, which is a little more complex than uh, Paley Park, uh, but both uh, really beautiful examples of uh, creating uh, uh, oases in the city. These, uh, these were really the, the models for uh, what are supposed to be the, uh, the uh, public amenities of the bonus plaza program. Uh, I'll just uh, show a couple more examples. Uh, this is a project I worked on. Uh, I probably could be criticized. We, uh, this was a municipal art society uh, sponsored project. Uh, we replaced a Paul Freeberg plaza from 1972 uh, with a, uh, uh, a much more green and park-like uh, uh, plaza. This, these are before and after pictures. Uh, the, the plaza suffered from access. It was very difficult to get there. Actually, nobody wanted to go up those set of steps. Uh, that was uh, redeveloped as part of our scheme uh, with Rogers and Marvel mm -hmm. and myself. And the, the large uh, uh, hardscape areas were removed and replaced with a landscape that is uh, much greener. Uh, that was, those are views of that new plaza. And it also is a, a much more, uh, I think, vital social space uh, than the, uh, the former. And, and again, there's an active program for cultural and event programming to give it uh, uh, social viability. Uh, the la last project I'll show is um, the Seven World Trade Center. Uh, in the rebuilding of, of this building, uh, David Childs uh, championed the idea of, uh, of returning the, uh, the Greenwich Street uh, uh, visual corridor. And what that did is it created a new triangular space, uh, which uh, my office designed as the Triangle Park. And it draws on uh, the earlier examples of Seagram and other plazas in creating a formal forecourt for the building, but it also incorporates, I think, the lessons of uh, Holly White in terms of creating uh, uh, bosques on both sides, which are really uh, good social spaces. And in fact, the, the, this. Uh, uh, site is uh, largely populated with people most times of the year. The, the seating is comfortable and there uh, are always uh, people uh, hanging out in this park. And I'll just uh, end with a question uh, about uh, the future of the privately owned public spaces. Um, I, I don't mean to pick on uh, Trump, but, uh, <laughs> but, but this, this, this plaza is indicative of, of what the public uh, bonus plaza program has become uh, throughout much of the city with fairly sterile, unprogrammed, unimaginative spaces. And then the, uh, the unintentional vitality of Zuccotti Park, which has become something it never intended, but in fact uh, has provided a great social function to the city. So I, I think that the pub public, privately owned public spaces do, form, do uh, provide a, a, a good service to New York City, uh, even in their unintentional uh, uses. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.